In today's talk, I'm going to be talking to you about how CFD codes compute the heat transfer coefficient. There are actually two different methods that CFD codes use to compute the heat transfer coefficient. In today's talk, I'm going to be going through both of those methods so that you'll understand the difference between them. And I'm also going to be showing you exactly how you can ensure that you're choosing the correct method in your CFD code when you calculate the heat transfer coefficient. I'm going to be looking directly at ANSYS CFX, ANSYS Fluent and OpenFoam. So if you use any of those CFD codes, this is definitely the talk that you want to watch to make sure that you choose the correct method for calculating the heat transfer coefficient. So sit back, take some notes. I know this talk is going to be extremely useful for you. So I'm going to start the talk just by giving a little bit of background about heat transfer coefficients and how they're calculated. And then after that, I'm going to move into looking at specifically how CFD codes compute heat transfer coefficients. So for a general background, the most important thing to remember is that a heat transfer coefficient is defined by Newton's law of cooling, which you can see there on the slide. And Newton's law of cooling is very general. You can apply it for any two objects. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fluids heat transfer simulation. So you've got two objects at different temperatures, T1 and T2, and the heat flux between the two objects given by capital Q is proportional to the temperature difference, T1 and T2. And the proportionality is defined by the heat transfer coefficient H and the surface area over which the heat transfer takes place. And I'm sure that you're all uh, very used to that general formula by now. Now, if we take Newton's law of cooling and apply it specifically to uh, convective heat transfer calculations, so calculations involving fluids and CFD, it's common rather than using the notation T1 and T2 to denote the temperatures of the objects, it's more common to use T wall and then T ref for the two temperatures, where T wall is the temperature of the solid wall and T ref is the temperature of the fluid, which we're going to talk about in a bit more detail as we go through this talk. And of course, remember that uh, this methodology is uh, equally applicable if the wall is hotter than the fluid or if the wall is colder than the fluid because of the, the sign convention. This formula will still work and give you a positive heat transfer coefficient regardless of whether the wall is hotter or colder than the temperature of the fluid. And so quite simply to define a heat transfer coefficient, what we do is we take Newton's law of cooling in equation one and rearrange it to give equation two there for H, the heat transfer coefficient. And what is commonplace in this formula, and you'll often see if you look online, but we've replaced uh, capital Q, that's the, the heat flux, uh, by the heat flux per unit area, which I've denoted by lowercase q, which you'll see there. And it's common to use the definition, which you'll see there in equation two, to calculate the heat transfer coefficient, uh, mostly because it's convenient, because CFD codes will uh, often compute the heat flux per unit area and output that in the post processor. So most places when you're calculating the heat transfer coefficient will be using equation two. And you can see in this formula, we've got uh, on the denominator of the fraction, we've got T wall, for the wall temperature and T ref for the fluid temperature. So up until this point in the talk, uh, it's all been very straightforward, but the one unknown that we haven't really thought about is what is the temperature of the fluid? What is T ref? How are we going to define that? And the reason we need to think quite carefully about what the reference temperature or the fluid temperature is, is because of course the fluid temperature varies considerably near the wall due to the thermal boundary layer. So if you had a classic flow over a flat plate, you might have a temperature profile like the temperature profile you can see there on the slide where uh, the temperature varies quite considerably near the wall and then it asymptotes to a steady state or a free stream value as you move further away from the wall. And so what this is telling us, this basic bit of understanding about the physics, is that we need to be quite careful about what reference temperature we choose for the fluid. Because if we choose a temperature that's quite close to the wall, then the reference temperature is going to be very different to the temperature that we might choose far away from the wall. 
So we need to think quite carefully about what we're gonna choose for the reference temperature. And that's what most of this talk is going to focus on. So first, I'm just gonna start with a very simple case, which is uh, external flow, which is uh, fairly common in a number of areas in fluid mechanics. So if you took an example of flow over a cylinder or an aerofoil or an object, for example, uh, it's common in the definition of the heat transfer coefficient to take that reference temperature as the temperature far away from the object or the free stream temperature T infinity. And you can see that here in the diagram that what we're effectively doing is we're moving far away from the object and whatever the temperature is far away from the object, uh, that's what we're gonna take as our reference temperature. And for the CFD calculations, that's quite likely to be the uh, either the inlet temperature to your domain or the temperature in the far field, far away from the object. So external flow is fairly straightforward. We know what reference temperature we're going to use in the heat transfer coefficient calculation. But uh, internal flow is slightly more complicated. If you consider the example uh, of heated flow in a pipe, for example, which you can see there, in the diagram, you've got uh, a heated wall at some temperature. And then of course, uh, in for the fluid flowing through the pipe, the temperature is going to form some kind of temperature profile, which could be parabolic in shape or could take uh, another, another shape depending on the flow conditions. Um, and of course here, we can't take uh, a, a free stream temperature because we're in an internal flow. And it turns out that the correct temperature to take for an internal flow is the mass flow average temperature of the temperature profile. And you could use the equation there on the slide if you wanted to compute an appropriate reference temperature. And if you want to see a, a derivation of that or, or how we arrive at the mass flow average for the appropriate reference temperature, then the best thing to do is to look at uh, a heat transfer coefficient textbook. So most uh, heat transfer and fluid flow textbooks will provide that derivation for you. But for the purposes of this talk, all we need to do is to appreciate that we've got a different reference temperature if we have an external flow simulation or an internal flow simulation. The appropriate reference temperature is going to be different. But now, if we move over and think about a CFD case in general, when we present our mesh and our geometry to the CFD solver, the geometry could be very general and the geometry could be complex or it could be very simple. And in general, the CFD code doesn't know the geometry that you've presented to it. The CFD code doesn't know if this is an internal flow simulation or an external flow simulation or some kind of mixture of both. And just to give you an idea of this, I've just got a, a made up geometry for you there on the slide uh, where you've got some kind of complex flow in a corner region of a geometry, for example, and the temperature of the wall is heated. And if you were to present this flow scenario to your CFD solver, it's not clear what the reference temperature would be just by looking at this geometry. And so the main question to think about here is where or how does the CFD code choose what the reference temperature is? There's got to be some way of working out where an appropriate reference temperature is and what it would be because once we have a reference temperature, we can use Newton's law of cooling to calculate the heat transfer coefficient. So that goes through a useful bit of background for this talk. We've had a little think about what the heat transfer coefficient is, how it's defined, and the importance of the reference temperature and how the reference temperature is gonna be different for internal flows and external flows. But what I want to do now is to jump in and show you uh, what things the CFD code will be thinking about when it's choosing the reference temperature. And generally, this is going to be different for different CFD codes. And so it's best that you understand what's happening and then have a look at your own CFD code so that you can work out what exactly it's doing. And I'm gonna finish the talk by going through uh, three uh, popular CFD codes so that you can see exactly what's going on there. So broadly speaking, there are two different methods that CFD codes use to define the reference temperature. And I've got these two different methods for you on the slide. The first method is that the CFD code looks at the cell that's adjacent to the wall, so that nearest cell that you can see there, and the CFD code uses the temperature at the centroid of that cell 
to define the reference temperature. So if you think of a, a general wall boundary in a CFD code, this could have a complex shape, it could be curved or straight. The CFD code, what it can do is it will just look at the cell that's next to the wall and take the temperature there as the reference temperature. That's the first method that the CFD code can use. The second method is to get the user, that's you, to input a value for the reference temperature yourself and then the CFD code can just use that. What I'm gonna do is focus now on these two methods to show you exactly how they're applied. So we're gonna start by looking at the first method, which is using the temperature of the nearest cell centroid to provide the reference temperature. And this is actually slightly more complicated than it might appear at first glance. And the reason for that is that the CFD code might be using wall functions between the centroid of the cell and the wall. And in general, what the CFD code needs is a method that's general and doesn't matter the method that we're using to specify the temperature between the centroid and the wall. So is there a method for defining this temperature uh, at the nearest cell centroid that doesn't matter what wall treatment we use? So is there a method that we can use uh, if our cell is very small and we are in the viscous sublayer and for those of you who've watched my previous talks, that would be a, a Y plus of less than five, for example. And can we also have the same method working for really large cells where we're using a wall function approach where our Y plus, for example, is between 30 and 200, say. Can we derive some kind of equation for the heat transfer coefficient that doesn't matter which of these wall treatments we use? And the reason this is important is not just because different CFD codes will use different treatments, but also because in the CFD domain, some cells may be in the viscous sublayer and some cells may be using a wall function approach. This may change depending on the cells. So we actually want a method that's general. So the way we're going to go about uh, deriving an equation for the heat transfer coefficient for these cells is to just assume firstly that the temperature variation between the wall and the cell centroid of that nearest cell is given by some function of Y plus, which you can see there in equation three. And at this point, it doesn't actually matter what the function of Y plus is. We just need to know that there's some function of Y plus that will give us the temperature at that cell centroid. And as a reminder, what will this function of Y plus look like? It may look something like the function which you can see there in the plot. And you'll remember from the talks on wall functions that generally uh, what happens is that CFD codes will use some function for Y pluses that are less than five, for example, and then they'll use another function for where Y pluses are between 30 and 200, say, and then some kind of uh, blending between them. But at this point, it doesn't actually matter what the function is. All we need to know is that there's some function that will calculate the temperature of that cell centroid that's adjacent to the wall. And what we're gonna do now is use the definition of T plus, which you can see there in equation four. And this is a standard definition. You can get this if you uh, look at a number of sources that look at wall functions. This is just the standard definition of T plus. And what we're gonna do is now rearrange that equation by using Newton's law of cooling, which you can see there in equation five. So we've got the heat transfer coefficient, it's just the heat flux divided by that temperature difference, where now the temperature of the, uh, the reference temperature we're using is the temperature of the cell, T cell. So that's the, the key substitution that we've made there. And we can substitute equation four into equation five and that allows us to reach uh, this boxed equation, which you can see there in equation five for the heat transfer coefficient. And for those of you who are ANSYS Fluent users, you'll notice that this is the same equation that's provided uh, in the Fluent manual for the wall function heat transfer coefficient. So we've managed to derive the equation, but what does it actually mean? How, how are we calculating the heat transfer coefficient? Well, what we're doing is we're taking those cells that are next to the wall and first thing we're doing is we're looking at Y plus. So we're looking for each of those cells, what's the value of Y plus? And then we're using that function from the previous slide, regardless of what it is, to calculate T plus. Then once we have T plus, we can just substitute that into equation five, and that gives us the heat transfer coefficient. 
So this method seems fairly straightforward. We've derived an equation for the heat transfer coefficient, and we can apply it for all the cells along all of the walls in our CFD domain. And it doesn't really matter whether we've got an internal flow or an external flow, we can still apply that same method. <coughs> but what's the problem with this method? Why don't we just use the same method universally for all CFD codes? Well, the problem with this method is that the reference temperature depends on the mesh. And the way to think about that is, of course, if you refine the mesh, if you make the cells smaller that are close to the wall, then the distance between the cell centroid and the wall is going to change. And so Y plus is going to change and the, the reference temperature is going to change. And what that means is that actually this method is no good if we are extracting a heat transfer coefficient and we want to compare it with experiments or to use it in some other uh, fluid based simulation software because the values that we've pulled out of the CFD code depend on the mesh and actually the reference temperature is going to be different for all of those cells. And so this method, while it is useful and we can uh, use it and apply it in general to any CFD simulation, it's not very useful to us because we can't really use the heat transfer coefficient that the code computes. And so actually the options we looked at before, option two would be a better option. And that's what we're gonna look at next. We're gonna look at uh, the ways that we input the reference temperature into the CFD code directly. And of course, uh, the method that you use to uh, input the reference temperature into CFD codes is going to vary depending on the code that you use, how you do it, where the box is. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you uh, three popular CFD codes. And if you happen to use one of those, of course, you can just use these methods. So starting with ANSYS CFX, you'll notice that if you are an ANSYS CFX user and you just start running the CFD simulation, you'll get a warning notice like the notice which you can see there on the slide. And what the warning notice is telling you is that by default, ANSYS CFX is using the temperature of that wall adjacent cell for the reference temperature, like we just went through before. So by default, ANSYS CFX is going to use the method that isn't very useful to you and you need to tell it to change. And so what I'm gonna do is just show you how you tell it to not use the wall adjacent cell temperature and instead use a reference temperature that you define instead. And the way to do that in ANSYS CFX is to open the expert parameters menu and you'll see a menu that looks something like this. And if you go into physical models, then right down at the bottom, there's an entry there called T bulk for HTC. And that is the reference temperature that CFX will use. So if you don't fill it in, CFX will automatically use the temperature of that cell centroid. But if you do fill it in, then CFX will override that and use your reference temperature that you define uh, for your simulations. And as a recap, that reference temperature could be the free stream temperature if you've got an external flow, or it could be the mass flow average uh, temperature if you've got an internal flow. So you have to enter it and that's where you enter it in. Now for ANSYS Fluent users, it's actually a lot more simple. ANSYS Fluent by default will just use the reference temperature that you specify in the reference values menu. So just in the reference values menu where you enter all your normal reference values, the temperature that you use there, that's the temperature that ANSYS Fluent is gonna to use to specify the heat transfer coefficient. So as long as you've specified that sensibly, then your heat transfer coefficient is going to be what you're looking for. But ANSYS Fluent isn't so straightforward because ANSYS Fluent also uses the nearest cell uh, temperature to calculate the reference temperature and actually gives you the option of both methods when you're post-processing. And you may have come across these if you're an ANSYS Fluent user. So it will give you access to what it calls a surface heat transfer coefficient. That's the method using the reference value that you input. And it will also give you a wall function heat transfer coefficient, which is the heat transfer coefficient based on that nearest cell centroid temperature. So ANSYS Fluent will actually give you options of both. And it's up to you to choose carefully and to choose the surface heat transfer coefficient value, because that's the one that's based on the reference temperature that you specify. Now for open foam users, things are a little bit more involved because you have to do 
a little bit more work to get the heat transfer coefficient out. So as you'll notice from OpenFoam as you normally use it, OpenFoam doesn't calculate the heat transfer coefficient automatically for you. You have to do a bit of work to tell it that you want the heat transfer coefficient. And the way that you're going to do that in OpenFoam is by using the various post-processing utilities that OpenFoam provides. You have to select the right one and then use it. So for OpenFoam 6 and later, OpenFoam actually included uh, a utility called wall heat transfer coefficient, which you can use to calculate the heat transfer coefficient based on that cell centroid value that we went through before. And I've got for you on the slide the command that you can use uh, to access that wall function heat transfer coefficient after you've finished your simulations. But of course, as we've been through before, we don't want to be using the temperature of the cell centroid. We want to be using a reference temperature instead. And to do that, you're actually going to have to calculate the heat transfer coefficient manually. And the way you do that is start by calculating the wall heat flux, that's Q. And you can get access to Q by using the, uh, uh, the calculation syntax, which you can see there on the screen. And this will produce a, a heat flux field for you with units of watts per meter squared. And the next thing, of course, is to define what the reference temperature is. And I find the easiest way to do this is to just do it in power view. So rather than uh, scripting up your own uh, utility in OpenFoam, I find it easier just to open the calculator in power view and first define a reference temperature. And then you can take that wall heat flux field that you just calculated and divide it by the temperature difference. And that will give you a new field, which is the heat transfer coefficient field, which you can visualize in power view. Now, for these scenarios so far that I've shown you, uh, they all assume that the reference temperature is constant. And that's going to be the case if you've got an external aerodynamics uh, flow, for example, the reference temperature for all of your cells is going to be the same value. And likewise, if you had just a constant pipe flow for an internal flow, then the reference temperature is going to be constant uh, all the way along the pipe. And it's going to be equal to the mass flow average uh, temperature there for all of those cells. So that's fairly straightforward. But there are some flow scenarios where the reference temperature is not constant and it's going to vary in the CFD domain. And just to give you an example of one of those flow scenarios, you can see here that I've got a, an internal flow geometry with an abrupt expansion. And of course, upstream, there's going to be one reference temperature because the mass flow average temperature is going to give you some value. And then downstream of this uh, abrupt expansion, there's going to be a different reference temperature. So for this flow scenario and for other more complicated flow scenarios, the reference temperature is actually going to be variable and is going to uh, vary in space. And for these flow scenarios, what you'll need to do is you'll actually need to specify and calculate your reference temperature as a function, either in the post processor or in some kind of user defined function if you're a fluent user or the CFX expression language if you're a CFX user. So you're going to have to actually do a lot more work to specify the reference temperature. And of course, as this is going to vary by geometry, I can't go through all of the examples in this talk, but it's sufficient to realize that you will need to work out what this reference temperature is as a field and then specify it so that you can calculate the heat transfer coefficient correctly for your example. And just before we finish up, there's a a simple point that I'd like to make that I think some of you may have picked up on while watching the talk and others of, others of you may have missed out on. And that that is actually the heat transfer coefficient that we've computed is actually a field. And so from the, the contour plots, which you can see on the slide and you may have seen before, you'll notice that the CFD code computes the heat transfer coefficient for every cell on the surface of your wall. So every cell on the surface of the wall is gonna have a heat transfer coefficient, which is gonna be different. And so as a result, when you open up the post processor, you can plot this as a surface field. And you'll see that H varies uh, over the entire field of your wall. And for the example that you can see here on the slide, uh, you've got H varying from uh, obviously the minimum value of zero, can't be negative, uh, all the way up to a maximum value of 20, it's varying over the surface depending on the temperature difference and the heat flux which is going to which is going to vary but 
Most often with the heat transfer coefficient, what we actually want to present to the user is a single value. And if we want to extract a single value, the best way to do it is to take an area weighted average of that field. And you can do that uh, either in your, in your post processor or in uh, uh, Fluent Post, for example, if you're a Fluent user. And that's how you get out the single value. You may want to average over the entire surface, or if you've got a developing flow, you may want to uh, average along the length so that the heat transfer coefficient varies with, with length. But the main thing to take away here is that the heat transfer coefficient is a field that's gonna vary over the entire surface as the heat flux varies, and therefore you're gonna to have to do some kind of averaging if you want to extract a single value or a profile for your heat transfer coefficient. So that, just to summarize what we've talked about in the talk, uh, the heat transfer coefficient uh, depends on the reference temperature that you choose for the fluid, that's T ref. And there are two methods that CFD codes use to specify the reference temperature. Either the CFD code will use the temperature of the nearest cell centroid, or it will get the user to input and specify what that reference temperature is manually. And of those two options, generally the temperature of the nearest cell centroid is not a good choice if you want to compare your heat transfer coefficient results to experiments or use the values in another application. And that's because in that other application, you'd also need to specify the reference temperature. And from the CFD, it's not clear what that would be and it would vary over the surface. So the best option is to input the value of the reference temperature yourself into the CFD code. Now, that's fine if you've got a constant reference temperature, but if your reference temperature is not constant, you're going to need to define it as an additional, a new function, uh, either in your post processor uh, or, as a, or in a UDF or the CFX uh, expression language. And then you'll have to calculate the heat transfer coefficient uh, for yourself in those applications. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, in today's talk, I decided to go with uh, a slightly different style of video. So rather than just showing a purely theoretical approach to the subject, I decided to actually show uh, a bit more application uh, for different CFD codes and to show and explain to you uh, where the different buttons were in the code and how you actually input the values of the reference temperature into the different CFD codes. Um, of course, I can't do all of the CFD codes. I just decided to use uh, three of the most popular ones. And uh, let me know if you found this useful. Uh, it's a different type of talk I haven't really done before, and I'm interested to see how you guys found it. Would you find it interesting and useful for your own applications? And would you like to see more talks of this style? Uh, so please let me know in the comments section. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you how you thought it went. And as always, thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you next time.